Take your Bibles now and turn with me to Acts chapter 16. And we will be reading verses 16 to 24, a very exciting passage of Scripture today uh, about Jesus and the power that Jesus has over evil. Uh, this passage is, describes for us what we might call a power encounter, where Paul and Silas in Philippi encounter evil and have to address it directly in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ. And so we're going to be learning today about confronting evil in the name of Jesus and the evil that we will need to confront in our culture in the power of Christ. So take your Bibles, turn to Acts 16. And let's stand as we read verse 16 to verse 24. Remember, Paul and Silas are there in Philippi. They've seen the conversion of a businesswoman named Lydia. And now they uh, meet not a businesswoman, but a possessed woman. And we'll see the power of Christ. Let's see, Acts 16, verse 16. I'll read down to verse 24. Let's remember... This is God's inspired word. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Thus far, the reading of God's word, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever and ever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that as we turn to your word, that you would open our eyes to the power of Jesus over the powers of darkness, and that you would remind us that we live in a world full of evil, and that you have called us to confront it, not in our own power, but in the name of Jesus. May your spirit be our teacher this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please be seated? Have you ever felt the presence of evil? When I speak to fellow Christians, and I ask them that question, the answer is almost always yes. I have felt the presence of evil. I could give you many different examples from my life and ministry where I have come face to face with the presence of evil, not just in the abstract, but in the real spiritual dynamic of that evil. I remember when I was in high school, my parents were having new windows put in our house. And a father-son team came over to put in our new windows. And when I saw the son, I recognized him, but I couldn't tell where I had seen him before. And then suddenly I was able to place him and I realized, oh, this is so-and-so from my youth group earlier on in high school. And so I started talking with him. He hadn't been in youth group for a while. And as I was talking to him, I realized he had something dangling from his neck. And as I looked closer, he had this little gargoyle-like idol hanging from his neck. And I asked him about that little 
amulet that he had hanging from his neck, and he said that it was, he was a pagan now, and that he worshipped this pagan god, and that he had discovered real power in paganism. And he went to talk to me about some of the spells he was able to perform and some of the incantations that he had done and some of the encounters he had had with these powerful forces and how it was so much superior to Christianity. And I'll tell you, when he was talking to me, I didn't doubt him for a moment, at least about the power that he experienced, not that it was superior to Christianity. But every hair on the back of my neck started to stand up as I heard the things that he related to me. And that's just one of many examples I could give you of times I've encountered people who've been involved either in the occult or in spiritualism or in the demonic, and I've experienced the power of evil. And it's not always in something like that. Sometimes you just encounter the presence of evil in conversations. I've had conversations even with Christian believers when I felt the presence and the power of evil governing that conversation. And if you think that's impossible, think about when Peter was trying to dissuade Jesus from going to the cross. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And so if Satan could speak through Peter, Satan can speak through a Christian even to this day. And so we know about the presence of evil. We know about the power of evil. And in our passage today, we see how Paul and Silas encountered real, personal, powerful evil in Philippi. And we see how when they encountered that real, personal, powerful evil in Philippi, they had to confront it, and they had to confront it directly. And as we look at this passage today, what I'm going to suggest to you is that we still live in a world that is dominated by evil. We still live in a supernatural world. We still live in a world where we can encounter demons and the evil powers of darkness. And we need to be aware of that. And we are called, like Paul and Silas, to confront evil and to confront it specifically and directly and not in our own name, but in the name of Christ. In fact, there's a verse I want you to lay on top of this whole passage, and that's Ephesians 5.11, where we are commanded, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Ephesians 5.11. We are not to take part in evil, but we are to expose evil. We are called to shine the light of Christ on the darkness of this world and cause it to flee. And that's exactly what Paul and Silas had to do in this passage. They had to confront evil directly in the name of Jesus. And we are called to confront it. We are called to expose it as well. Well, I want you to notice some lessons that will help us in confronting evil in this passage. Three truths. First of all, I just want you to notice the basic and the obvious one we see as we're reading through this. And that is, evil is real. Evil is real. Now, I'm not just talking about evil in the abstract. But I'm talking about the personal side of evil, the demonic side of evil. That there is a real personal devil. There are real personal spirits called demons. And we encounter a slave girl here who was possessed by an unclean spirit and who was able to practice divination. Now literally in verse 16 when it says that this slave girl had a spirit of divination, it literally says a spirit of python. And most commentators will tell you that it goes back to the Greco-Roman worldview where there was an oracle at Delphi, and there was a legend that a python spirit guarded the oracle of Delphi, and that that was destroyed by the power of Apollo, and then that spirit went out and would inhabit people and give them the ability to soothsay and prognosticate and fortune tell. And so the spirit of Python that was in this slave girl is a spirit of divination, or soothsaying, or fortune-telling. It was a spirit of the uh, occult. And so you see that evil is real here, and that evil gave this slave girl real power. It doesn't say that this was made up. There's a real dark power here of divination, or soothsaying, and fortune-telling. Now we know that this was a dark power, an evil power, 
Because in the Old Testament law, God spoke about all these practices of necromancy and mediums and witchcraft and fortune-telling in the Old Testament, and they were all forbidden in the Old Testament. For example, if you put your fingers in Acts 16 and then flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 18, you'll learn something interesting about all of these powers of darkness, of the occult and divination. It says in Deuteronomy 18, in verse 9, God says this, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of these nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Believe it or not, they did that. They burned their children alive as an offering to the false gods of the land. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these Nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. So God makes it very clear that these things, this spiritualism and consulting mediums and trying to contact the dead, that this is an abomination to God. And it's such an abomination to God that God had the people of Israel to go in and exterminate all the Canaanites for these kinds of wicked practices. Men, women, children, boys and girls, wipe them all out because this is such a serious abomination on the land. That's how strongly God spoke about it. And God's very clear the people of Israel are not to practice these things at all. They're not to flirt with them. They're not to make light of them. They're not even to think of these things, but to be totally set apart from all of these works of darkness. There's not a hint in Deuteronomy 18 or in Acts 16 that any of these things are just sleight of hand or that they're just made up. But rather, there is every indication to believe that these are demonic in origin and powerful and evil and yet of a dark and unclean power. And so you see that evil is real and evil is controlling this slave girl to practice this divination, this soothsaying. Now, whenever I talk about the occult... There are always people who say, why are you going on about that? And I have to tell you that if you're thinking that, you are so unbelievably naive. Because in every single church I've ever been in, I have known members in good standing who are in one way or another involved in the occult. And yet, whenever I preach on this subject, people will say, oh, why are you making such a big deal about that? We live in an enlightened society and no one ever does that thing does those sorts of things. And yet in every church I've ever served, I've encountered at least one person who either reads their horoscope, or on their vacation has their palm read, or has tarot cards flipped for them, or who watches a TV program where there's a medium, and uh, it's not as unheard of as you would think. It's naive to think that this is not a real thing that goes on. Also, uh, some people think that this just isn't all that common. Well, did you know there was a headline in the news this pa past week about a church in Atlanta, Vision Church in Atlanta, a Pentecostal church, and they hired a medium on their church staff, someone who contacts the dead, someone who can tell you your fortune and she's paid staff on the church. And so don't tell me it's not common. I've, I've encountered it enough to know better, and the Bible's very clear that this stuff is real, it is dangerous, and our culture tries to pretend as if it's safe and fun and tries to normalize it. Just like our culture loves to try to normalize sexual sin, our culture loves to try to normalize spiritual deviancy as well. In fact, uh, the boys and I went to see a movie, The Addams Family, the new Addams Family movie that came out, and I thought Addams Family would just be kind of fun, and there would be you know, nothing in The Addams Family that would be bad at, you know, or anything like that. I was naive. 
Because in that movie, there was a homosexual couple wearing the gay flag on them. And also, the, a lady in the movie uses a Ouija board to try to contact, and a crystal ball to try to contact the dead. These things aren't just fairy tales. The Bible talks about these things and says these are evil. And so this, we don't know how this slave girl got this spirit of divination, but she was possessed, and there was a real power there. And there was not only a real power there, but there was an allure, wasn't there? Because you see, she had owners, and the owners were exploiting her evil for financial gain. Because they realized that they could make money off this power. And so they were making a good living off her fortune-telling. You know, the, one of the reasons why you can encounter evil in a child's movie like The Addams Family or just in the newspaper horoscope section or in the op-ed section or wherever you go, really, in this world, you can encounter evil. As you encounter that evil, you realize that it is, a, it is a real power, and yet the reason why people find it so appealing is you can make a lot of money on evil. Satan's business is booming. The porno, pornography industry in this country is a multi-million dollar industry. Did you know that? And Satan is very much involved in the pornography industry. And you can pick out all kinds of industries, whether it's mediums or spiritualism or uh, evil, of any different kind, and people are making a lot of money on this kind of stuff. And so sure enough, these owners had exploited this evil, and they were making a lot of money. And the evil might even be a little bit deceptive in its power, because notice that this slave girl starts speaking about Paul as Paul and Silas have come to town in verse 17, and she cries out, these men are servants of the Most High who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Notice how sinister that is. It's 100% true. They are servants of the Most High. They are proclaiming the way of salvation. But don't you understand that Satan and the, the forces of darkness can say something true to an evil purpose? When, Jesus tempt, uh, when Satan tempted Jesus, he quoted Scripture, didn't he? All those Scriptures he quoted were true. They were Scriptures, but he twisted them. Uh, and he uses them to his own advantage. And so uh, this woman was crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. She was speaking the truth, but to an evil purpose. Now, I interpret this most likely she was being a nag, and she was being annoying, and she was being a distraction to what Paul and Silas were trying to do. And yet this evil spirit was real, this evil spirit was powerful, and this evil spirit was appealing because they were making a lot of money off this little mad slave. But notice not only here that you see the, the fact that evil is real, the second truth you need to see here is that Jesus has power over evil. Jesus has power over evil. Notice that as this slave uh, girl is possessed and she's telling fortunes and making a lot of money and uh, these men, no doubt, are encircling her and protecting her and, uh, and she's proclaiming out the fact that uh, Paul and Silas are servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. Paul is annoyed. He's irritated. She's, she's a hindrance. She's getting in the way. And Paul must have discerned the evil spirit that was behind what she was doing. Because in verse 18, Paul looks at this slave girl and he says what? I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Now, I want to say something about exorcism because there's a lot of confusion about this. Because of the way uh, the church developed, especially in the medieval period, when people think of exorcism, they think of um, a ceremony or a ritual. And so, for example, if you see the, uh, the movie The Exorcist from 1973, and um, you see how the Catholic priest comes over, and what does he do? He performs a ceremony that he's inherited from the church. But in the Bible, you'll never find one example of a ceremony for exorcism. They're just not there. Because an exorcism in the Bible is not 
a ceremony. It is not a ritual. It is something that a servant of God does. He does with an authoritative word, and the demon comes out immediately. It's not sensationalized like in Hollywood. It's not this, all the crazy stuff you see in those spooky movies. But Jesus has power over evil, and Paul says, I command you, come out. And this spirit comes out to show the power of Jesus over the powers of darkness. And yet a lot of people conceive of this exorcism or as something of a ritual. We'll find it in the Bible. It's not in the Bible anywhere. There's no ritual. There's no ceremony. There's none of this holy water stuff and salt being thrown on people or anything like that. But when you want a demon to come out, you say, in Jesus' name, out, and it will come out. Because the Bible says that we have authorities over scorpions and serpents. We have authority over the powers of darkness in Christ because Christ is greater than these powers of evil. And so, immediately and effectively, that spirit came out. We don't talk a lot about this in the West and in our enlightened society, but I found a lot of pastors that I've spoken to have at least had one encounter with the demonic and seen the power of Jesus over the demonic. Most pastors don't talk about it for fear of offending people or for fear of not being believed. But the reality is, even though maybe in our country and culture it's not as common um, as it once was in the first century when the gospel's going forth to new mission fields, it still happens today. People are still can be possessed by demons, and demons can still be cast out in the name of Jesus Christ. And this is a reality, and you see people who come under the power of darkness, and that Jesus is the only hope to get them out of that power of darkness. I think of a story told by Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a pastor in the 20th century, and he was pastoring at this time in South Wales and at Westminster Chapel. And uh, there was a woman who was uh, a spiritualist, and she was a medium. And she actually made money by telling fortunes, and she made a, a good amount of money, according to Dr. Lloyd-Jones. And one day she missed her spiritualist meeting, and she knew a lot of Christians who were going to the chapel, and um, so she thought she would go find out what it's all about. And she went into the chapel, and eventually she just kept coming and coming, and she became a Christian. She became a believer in Jesus. And Lloyd-Jones was asking her later about how she had become a Christian. And she said, well, it was so strange. When I went to the chapel and I heard the preaching of the Word of God, I sensed a power. And it was very similar to the power I sensed in my spiritualist meeting. But this was a clean power and a pure power. And I knew that this was the greater power. And she gave her life to Christ. She repented and she believed the gospel and she was saved. Why? Because she experienced the power of Jesus over the powers of evil. Now we're going to encounter evil in our world today. We're going to encounter evil in different forms. It might not be people making money off mediums, though that's not impossible. There was a show recently that came out all about a medium. And this kind of witchcraft and evil is all through cinema and American culture. So it's not far-fetched that people could be using divination today to, to make money and things like that. But the reality is we're going to encounter it all over the place in our culture, especially as our culture has rejected God, rejected the Bible, rejected morality, rejected the truth. I mean, if we ever had a day to sing, though this world with devils filled should threaten, do undo us, it's today. As we just sang this morning, in a mighty fortress is our God. This world is full of devils. This world is full of evil. And as believers, we are the light that is to penetrate the darkness and confront that evil. And we need to know that Jesus has power that is greater than the powers of darkness. Whenever Jesus showed up, people who were demon-possessed fell down. They shrieked. They said, don't throw us into the pit before the appointed time. Don't cast us out. If you're going to cast us out, at least cast us out into some pigs. The evil forces of darkness know that Jesus has the ultimate power. His power is above 
all things, the Bible says, visible and invisible, created everything, angels and demons and rulers, present and to come. Jesus is the sovereign king of all. And that's why his name has authority over all unclean powers. So you see that evil is real. But note that Jesus, in whom we are, has power over evil. But notice the third thing here. When we confront evil in the name of Jesus, and this is what the American church really needs to understand, we will experience the hostility of the world. When we confront evil in the name of Jesus, we will experience the hostility of the world. If you are a Christian and you are living in the world and you don't experience the hostility of the world, something's not right. Because we are in the light, the world is in the darkness. We have the truth, the world is in, the, in error. Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you. And wherever Paul and Silas went, wherever Paul and Barnabas went, when they preached Jesus, what did they experience? The hostility of the world, the rejection of the world, the taunting of the world, the mockery of the world. We should be ashamed that we don't experience more of that because it, it reflects on the contrast that we're making. Do we really have a righteousness that's reflecting on their corruption? But notice what it was that really angered the world. Verse 19, But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, what did they see? All the money going out the door. This demon has been cast out. This demon helped her to prognosticate and contact the dead and engage in soothsaying. And now our little golden goose is no longer able to lay a golden egg. I mean, we, she's worthless. She's just a slave girl now. And so the money's gone. And so when they realize that the message of the cross is a threat to their godless economy and their godless money-making, they seize Paul and they seize Silas and they drag them before the rulers. And then we see this persecution escalating against them. You know, that still happens today when, when Christians are a threat to people making money that's when the hostility of the world really comes down. That's when you really receive the rejection and hatred of the world. When I, was, um, when I grew up, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church in Snellville, Georgia, and the pastor of our church for a period of time was an amazing um, preacher of God's word and a, one of these fearless types who's not afraid just to lay it out there and say it like it is. And uh, he went on to become the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he... Um, once was at the gas station on the corner where the church was in Snellville. And uh, when he was, went to the counter at the gas station, he um, noticed behind the counter that they had all the pornographic magazines up and they weren't covered up. They were just there for anyone who went to the counter to see. And the Lord impressed on his heart that he needed to say something about that. And um, he said to the cashier, he said, you, he said, you see all those magazines behind here? He said, those are a disgrace and disgusting. And he said, you can take them down by the end of the day today, or I'm going to ask my entire church to boycott this gas station. How do you think the owner of that gas station felt? He was pretty upset. But guess what? He took down the magazines. If we as believers in Christ would start taking stands for things, if we'd start, stop funding evil, Stop throwing our money at things that are um, in enmity to God, whether they're movies, our music, our books, our um, whatever it might be. If we would stop funding evil and we would take a stand in the name of Christ against evil, we would experience the hostility of the world because people would see the money going out the door. People would not want us. You can see some uh, even established business establishments that have tried to govern themselves according to the principles of the Word of God, and they've experienced the hostility of the world. I think of Chick-fil-A. Maybe you saw that headline about Chick-fil-A, first Chick-fil-A opening in the UK, and they shut her down. Why? Not because they didn't like the chicken sandwich. They shut her down because they knew they believed that marriage is between a man and a woman. So offensive. 
They're not pro LGBTQ, whatever the acronym is now for wickedness. If you stand for truth and you stand for righteousness and you confront the darkness, you're going to invite the hostility of the world. But notice, this hostility comes first in a verbal form. This is very important. A verbal form before a, before a physical form. Notice what happens. They, they drag them before the magistrates, and what do they say? These men are Jews. They are disturbing our city. They're advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept our practice. What do they do? Slander them. I'm telling you right now, mark my words, a culture that slanders God's people is a culture one step away from physically abusing, imprisoning, torturing, killing God's people. In every single generation of the church, it always began with verbal threats, and then it moved to physical infliction of pain. Always. You read through the early church, we just got through studying church history. What did the Romans say? The Romans said they're cannibals because they eat the body and blood of Christ. Verbal threat. They, uh, are, they are guilty. Christians are guilty of incest because they call each other brother and sister, and they love each other. Christians are atheists because they don't worship the Roman gods. And it wasn't too long after they started saying those things that Christians were burning on stakes at Nero's dinner party. It always goes from verbal threats to physical threats. It's just the way Satan works, and Satan escalates the powers of the beast. And we have to realize that that's what happened in Philippi. They said, these men are disturbing our city. They're, uh, they're anti-Roman custom and culture. They knew that would get the magistrates worked up. And so the crowds joined in attacking them. They stripped off their garments, just like Jesus was treated. And they beat them with rods. And then they threw them in the prison and put them in the stocks. And they left them there until they decided what to do with them at a more convenient time. That's the hostility of the world. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but it instead expose them. We have, we have to have the courage and we have to have the confidence and we have to have the fortitude to stand and look evil in the face and say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And that happens in all sectors of society. Christians should be on the front lines fighting against the evils of abortion, fighting against the evils of pornography, fighting against the evils of sex trafficking, fighting against the evils of racism, fighting against the evils of our society. Why? Because these things are not just things that sinful people do. There is a demonic side to it. And if you don't believe there's a demonic side to it, come with me and stand and minister outside the abortuary in Augusta, where women are going and murdering their children. You will see and feel the presence of evil. Because that health care center for women is a haunt for every unclean spirit in Augusta, probably. And I'm dead serious about that. If we stand for Christ, and we stand in the power of the Spirit, and we stand in the armor of light, and we stand for the truth, we will invite the hatred of the world. We will be the scum of the earth, the Bible says. And we will experience persecution. And in our culture, we have to go no holds barred against evil. We should be known as Christians, not only by our love, but by a love that fearlessly and boldly and courageously speaks the truth. And lets the sticks fall where they may. We need men and women of character and spiritual fortitude and confidence and boldness who are willing, like Paul, to look evil in the face and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, out! And there are so few Christians who are willing to do that. But when we know that Jesus has power over evil, and that as we sang this morning, that though this world with devils filled should threaten 
to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. When we know that God is willed for His truth and His light and His grace and His mercy and His love and His righteousness to triumph over all the filthy powers of darkness, when we know that, we can rejoice because we're on the winning side. Christ has crushed the serpent head, serpent's head. Christ has defeated Satan. Christ is the one who throws him into the bottomless pit and into the lake of fire. Christ vanquishes Satan and all of his evil hordes. And we are in Christ. And so let's live like it. Let's confront darkness because the light shines into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we know that we live in a world that is a dark place, a place where people engage in sin, they love sin, and even a place where people can make some money doing sin. And Lord, we think about how Paul and Silas lived in that same world and yet confronted evil head on by invoking the name of Jesus in the power of the Spirit. Lord, we know that evil may have a different manifestation in our culture and our time in history, and yet the call is no different. We must, we must, we must confront evil in the face in the name of Jesus, and we must not be afraid, but trust in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would give us boldness, and we also pray that you would help us to be expectant that when we start attacking the strongholds of the enemy, that we're inviting ridicule, rejection, persecution, and hostility. But when we engage in that combat, we are doing the very thing that you've called us to do, and that is to know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of darkness in heavenly places. And we are to be strong in you and in the strength of your might, that we might stand against all the schemes of the devil, and we are to put on the full armor of God that we might be able to stand in that evil day. Lord, help us to put every piece of that armor on with prayer and to stand for righteousness and for Jesus. We pray in his good name. Amen.